There are secret tunnels and caves everywhere underneath our feet. The porous rock of the Yucatan Peninsula gives way to fresh water-filled cenotes and passageways on almost every block here. Our friend Rocco came and rescued Robbie and I from our boat work by bringing us to a piece of land about five minutes drive from Puerto Aventuras. It's a popular cave diving spot that has been explored extensively and mapped. Very interesting how the underwater caves have the same kind of cartography as, as the charts that we look at for navigation. <laughs> Many people bring or rent real dive equipment, but it is also possible to simply take a swim here. Without dive lights or other equipment, you can enter one underwater passageway. You can dive under the rock, swim through a very short tunnel, and come up on the opposite side in a room lit by a hole in the jungle floor. It's kind of spooky, but this is an experience which divers flock to. Tiny strings tied to the ceiling and the floor of the underwater caves mark the explored passageways and guide divers along in the event that dive lights go out or that the water becomes too cloudy. This cenote also doubles as a spa with the usual hungry cave fish that nibble at your precious and delectable dead skin flakes. We're so happy to have been brought to this location by our friend. There are so many cenotes up and down the Mayan Riviera it's difficult to know which ones are worth paying admission to, and it's worth knowing about their secret tunnels, and where not to open up your head on the rock ceiling, which is something we avoided here, but not elsewhere, which you will hear about soon. Back to work. Our huge pilot house windows are leaking and we have had enough. We know from experience that removing the rim and the glass from these sorts of windows will probably entail breaking something. So I'm only going to attempt to remove the material from the inside first, to begin drying the area out and seeing what can be done. There is a lot of oxidized aluminum from the stainless steel screws and old silicone that was trapping rainwater in between the sandwich layers. The windows are made of glass, of course, and I have to stress that it will be very tricky to remove them whole without any breaks or cracks. A little more knife work here too, as usual, but this time with a little culinary twist. With all the care and precision that he usually gives to his catch, Robbie removes the big bones and then the smaller tricky ones, including the belly spines, to feed our little menace, Choco. Our little beast knows very well that when we have a couple of fish around, he will get a cut of the catch. Choco, your food is being made? On this winter day, a solar cooked meal for ourselves and the dog. Some fish, some carrot, 45 minutes in the sun, and some rough cut oats. It's such a hard wait. I have to admit, it doesn't look so great, and we don't ever get thanked for making it. But the dog always gets compliments on his shiny fur afterwards. And a treat during the holidays from our neighbors, panettone. It is a much-loved treat here in Mexico, especially by the Italian population and Robbie's Italian portion of belly. The Panettone celebrations happened right around the time of the passing out incident. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of Robbie hitting the ground of our boat. We were watching a movie where you had a movie on the computer and then I woke up to the sound of you falling on the floor and then I, I was like, Robbie, what are you doing? Like, why are you on the floor? And you weren't answering me. I was like, Robbie, Robbie. And this went on for a good like 30 seconds. I was like, Robbie, what are you doing on the floor? What's going on? You didn't gain consciousness again until basically I slapped your face. I was like, whoosh. 
<laughs> what's going on here? Like, and then you, you started talking. You were like, oh, what? And then you did get up and I, remembering all my first aid training was like, no, don't get up, uh, you know, because of the possibility of, of spinal injury. You're not supposed to let, uh, like a, in a first aid situation, you, you try to not have the person, the patient, the victim get off, off the ground quickly. But you were just like, oh, oh, I'm getting up now. And I was like, no, no, don't get up. And you were like, no, I have to clean this up. And you were like, already <laughs> with the towel, like ragging up the blood that was squirting out of your head. And I was like, no, no, we need to know what happened. Like, don't, don't clean it up. But you had already wiped it away and you were quite lucid. You were like, oh, yeah. why don't we call uh, our friends who are staying on Vintas, like just down, down the canal. So we called them and luckily our friends came over with the car yeah. and, but didn't bring you very far. We just went to Vintas. Yeah. Which happens to have a first aid kit on it, including sutures and stuff for stitching up. And Tony showed up, who is the owner of Vintas and the first aid kit. And of course he also owns the uh, sail loft slash uh, stitching shop. <laughs> so next thing I knew, uh, he was stitching you up. You went and you got a blood pressure test and it was like normal. Yep. So I don't know, I guess it would be best to go get a lot of medical testing to figure it out. But for now, uh, low blood pressure and and feeling woozy from a gory film is what we're we're chalking it up up to basically. Why is that funny? Don't laugh. I have this is funny, I like the gory movie part. Especially I'm a big fan of like horror movies. Especially since I'm interspersing this footage with you uh, <laughs> carving up animals and fish carcasses so I, I don't know it's I find it kind of interesting that uh, the man who who carves up uh, fish bodies for a living was so grossed out by a scene in a movie that he, he fell down but um, that he fainted after regular cleaning of the cut with sterile pads and water some antibiotic cream, and a sterile bandage every day. A week and a half later, the stitches looked ready to come out when the wound had completely sealed itself up. What had we learned this time around? Well, it re-illustrated the importance of being prepared with proper first aid supplies and familiarity with the supplies and how to use them. Back to work again, forced back to work because both our stainless steel water tanks were leaking now. And so that meant opening up the entire pilot house floor. It also meant removing several hundred kilos of lead piled up around the starboard water tank to balance out the weight distribution of the boat. We considered this to be more bilge treasure. We had finally found the gold. At least I think lead might be worth something like gold. To remove certain portions of the pilot house floor, we would also have to disassemble the steering structure. And then after removing the floor, we found out that there is actually double the amount of lead in the bilge than we had originally thought. We hoisted out the first water tank using our brand new halyard. And then we got right back to removing the port side tank, which was slightly larger than the first. After brushing off the tanks with a spinning steel brush, all I could find were some tiny pits, mostly located in the welded parts of the tank. These were definitely the cause of the slow leaks. Well, then everything just seemed to be leaking. Windows leaking, water tanks leaking, 
and the precious lifeblood trying to escape Robbie's skull. A project that did not exist the week before now had us waist deep in the bilge, reconfiguring the cabin sole to fit without the support of the old water tank. We are thinking of constructing fiberglass tanks on each side instead, or perhaps combining fiberglass construction with flexible water tanks. Unfortunately, either way, for the time being, life will involve sticking a hose through the galley window for water. Ish. Miraculously, he managed to pry off those big pilot house windows. And so the next step was to prep the area and to rebed them. Clean the metal rim of the window with a wire brush. Wrap the outer edge of the window in plastic wrap. Put the window into position with the help of some wooden wedges, three part epoxy, one part hardener, and of course, lots of filler. Fill the gap in between the window and the wooden window edge with thickened epoxy. Find out how it all comes together in the next video.